Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to cut through the noise, get straight to what matters. Today, um, a really big topic, yeah. stress and coping. Huge and absolutely central to healthcare. Exactly. We're pulling from Fundamentals of Nursing, the 11th edition Potter, Perry, Stockard, and Hall. Solid stuff. The gold standard, really. Our mission today is to unpack this uh, complex chapter, understand stress, how it hits patients, families, and nurses too. That's key. Right. This is vital info for you, whether you're, you know, deep in your nursing studies, already practicing, or honestly just trying to get a handle on stress and well-being. We'll connect the dots between the nursing concepts and what you actually do in practice. Clinical decisions, pitfalls, yeah. the real deal. And we've got a case study to ground it all. John and Sandra Edwards, he's got stage three pancreatic cancer just diagnosed. Yeah, seeing how the theories play out with them, mm -hmm. that makes it stick. We'll circle back to John and Sandra as we go. Okay, let's start at square one. Stress. What is it fundamentally? Good question. The book defines it as like a hazard, right? Right. Real or even just perceived to your body's balance. Exactly. Your body wants stability, that state of homeostasis. Stress is anything physical, chemical, emotional that throws a wrench in that creates tension. Now, the stressors are the specific things triggering it. Physical things, psychological stuff, social pressures. Yep. And they're not all equal. Some are big and sudden. Others are low level, but just grind away over time. Think about Sandra worrying day in, day out about John, that chronic stuff. It adds up. Mm -hmm. It's got a massive impact, even if it seems small day to day. And so much depends on appraisal. That's um, how you interpret the stressor. What does it mean to you? What resources do you think you have to deal with it? So it's not just the event itself, but how you see it. Precisely. Stress really ramps up when you see something as a threat and you feel like you don't have what it takes to handle it. Overwhelmed. That explains why two people facing, say, the same diagnosis like John has might react totally differently. One sees a threat, the other maybe finds resilience, growth even. Absolutely. It's all about your perception, the support you have, your usual coping style. And if those coping tools just get completely swamped, that's a crisis. Okay. And trauma. That's when the stress symptoms hang around long after the event. Right. Even when the stressor itself is gone, the effects linger. Let's get into the physiology. Han Sally. He kind of cracked the code on the physical side of stress, didn't he? The general adaptation syndrome, GAS. He did. Groundbreaking stuff. He showed... Our bodies have this like universal response. Doesn't matter if it's a real physical danger or, you know, a huge deadline. Same basic reaction. The fight or flight thing. Life saving sometimes, but But when it's switched on all the time, that's the problem. This whole process, the GAS, it works through the neuroendocrine mechanism. Basically, brain talks to hormones super fast. The body's trying to get back to balance or allostasis. So GAS is three stages. First up, alarm stage. Yep. Classic fight or flight. Central nervous system kicks into high gear, hormone surge, epinephrine, norepinephrine, heart pounds, blood pressure up, more oxygen, muscles get more blood flow. You're mentally sharp, pupils dilate, ready for action. Totally. Then if the stress keeps up, you hit the resistance stage, the body tries to adapt, stabilize things, hormone levels, heart rate, ideally start coming back down. But it's still working hard, right? Right. Repairing damage, using up energy. Oh yeah, it takes a toll. And if the stress still doesn't let up. Exhaustion stage, that sounds bad. It is. The body's defenses start to break down, compensatory mechanisms fail, energy stores, gone. The physiological response actually ramps up again, but your ability to adapt is shot. And this constant state of being on physiologically, mm -hmm. that leads to allostatic load. Exactly. Think of it like wear and tear on your body's systems from chronic stress. It's not just feeling stressed, it's actual physical mileage. Leading to real problems, hypertension, depression, messed up sleep, even autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. And it hammers the immune system too. Mm -hmm. Makes you more vulnerable to infections, raises risks for diabetes, high blood pressure, maybe even some cancers. Wow. And psychologically, people react differently too, based on intensity, duration, control, support. Absolutely. Which brings us back to appraisal. Primary appraisal is that first gut check. Is this bad? A threat? A loss? Or maybe a challenge. And secondary appraisal happens almost at the same time. Yeah. Thinking, okay, what can I do about this? What coping strategies do I have? Yes. And stress hits hardest when the what can I do feels way less powerful than the is this bad question. It's a dynamic thing, always shifting. So how do we actually cope? What does that involve? Coping is all the stuff you think and do to manage the stressor, 
It's super individual, depends on age, culture, past experiences, the specific situation. Right. And people use different approaches, like problem-focused coping. Yeah, that's taking direct action. Like, if you're stressed about an exam, studying harder is problem-focused. You're trying to change the situation. And emotion-focused coping. That's about managing the feelings around the stress. Maybe taking deep breaths before the exam, talking to a friend to vent anxiety, trying to feel better about the situation, even if you can't change it directly. Most people use a mix. Makes sense. And your personal resources matter hugely here, right? Problem-solving skills, money, friends, health, optimism, mindfulness. Definitely. All those things buffer stress. We also have unconscious strategies, ego defense mechanism. Ah, uh, like denial. Or, or blaming someone else. Exactly. Denial, displacement, yelling at your spouse when you're mad at your boss, regression, acting younger. They protect us emotionally, short-term usually. Unconscious stuff. Let's talk types of stress. Acute versus chronic. Okay. Acute is time limited. New job stress, maybe a minor surgery. It has an end point. Chronic is the long haul. Living with illness like John, caregiving like Sandra, maybe poverty, a bad job. It just grinds on. Then there's post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Huh. That follows a major trauma combat disaster assault. Intense fear, helplessness. Symptoms like flashbacks, nightmares, detachment. Often comes with depression too. Yes. And related, especially for healthcare folks, is secondary traumatic stress. That's from witnessing other people's trauma, like nurses in the ICU or oncology. Precisely. It's a big part of compassion fatigue. You absorb the suffering. It shows up as intrusive thoughts, avoiding things, sleep problems. It's tough. And when coping just collapses, that's the crisis point you mentioned. Yeah, a turning point. Old ways don't work. You have to change. Three types. Maturational developmental, like becoming a parent, requires new skills. Situational, triggered by external events like John's illness or losing a job. And adventitious, those are major disasters, natural or man-made or violent crime. Big, unexpected shocks to the system. And in a crisis, the key nursing questions are, what does this mean to you and how will this affect your life? It's make or break time, really, growth or regression. Definitely. And all this ties into established nursing theories, like Betty Newman's systems model. Right. She sees the person, family, community as systems. Stress in one part affects the whole thing. Talks about lines of defense, buffers. Mm -hmm. And Calisteroy's adaptation model focuses on how people adapt to stimuli and how nurses help create that adaptive healing space. And Pender's health promotion model. That's yeah. more about building wellness, right? More. Managing stress proactively with diet, exercise, things like that. Exactly. These models give us frameworks for understanding and intervening. Okay, let's broaden out. Factors influencing all this. Huge variation, right? Lifespan, kids, teens, adults, older adults. They all face different stressors and cope differently. Absolutely. And situational factors. The healthcare workplace itself is a pressure cooker. High acuity, distractions, responsibility. Shift work, too. That messes with your body clock, increases stress. For sure. And chronic illness for the patient and the caregiver, like Sandra. The uncertainty, the limits, the money worries. Massive stress. Then there are maturational factors tied to developmental stages, like adolescents searching for identity, dealing with peer pressure. Middle adults juggling careers, kids aging parents, older adults facing loss of autonomy, health issues, each stage has its own stress profile. And sociocultural factors, poverty, disability, violence, homelessness, these are huge. And don't forget social isolation and loneliness, especially common in older adults, that feeling of disconnect. It's really bad for mental and physical health. Depression, infection risk. Yeah, feeling connected matters so much. Yeah. And culture shapes everything, doesn't it? How you see stress, how you cope, family roles. Totally. What's stressful in one culture might not be in another. As nurses, we have to understand the patient's cultural lens to give good care. It's not one size fits all. Okay, let's focus specifically on nurses. Compassion fatigue. We touched on it, that mix of burnout and secondary drama. It's real. Constantly giving, constantly seeing suffering. It wears you down. Burnout itself is when the demands just feel way bigger than your resources. Exhaustion, cynicism, feeling ineffective. What triggers it? Staffing issues, long hours, tough cases, bad teen dynamics? All of the above. And the impact, fear, anxiety, depression, maybe lashing out. It's why self-care and supportive workplaces are absolutely non-negotiable for nurses. Mm -hmm. And then there's second victim syndrome. Yeah, this is when a nurse is involved in a medical error that harms a patient. The psychological fallout for the nurse can be devastating, like PTSD, guilt, shame, fear. They need support, right? Not blame, 
understanding, transparency. Absolutely crucial. Agencies need systems in place to support staff through that. Okay, this all leads us to the nursing process, applying all this knowledge. How do nurses use critical thinking here? It's about pulling everything together, the theory, your experience, the patient's situation, ethical standards, analyzing cues, making connections. Like, how would you tell if a patient, say, Sandra, is moving from alarm to resistance? You'd look for signs of stabilization, right? Vitals may be starting to normalize a bit. The super intense fight or flight look might ease off even though they're still under strain. Exactly, you're observing those subtle physiological shifts. That's critical thinking in action during assessment. Assessment always starts with the patient's view, building trust, asking open-ended questions, like Matt did with Sandra and John. Right, he saw they were tired, Sandra looked overwhelmed, John was worried about her. And he listened. Sandra felt hopeless, exhausted, couldn't focus, had headaches, no appetite, lost weight, stressors, John's cancer, chemo side effects, and that work stuff. And Matt noted the objective signs too, the fidgeting, poor eye contact, tears, those elevated vitals. Crucially, you always have to ask about safety, suicidal or homicidal thoughts. Can't skip that. Absolutely. Then, analysis and nursing diagnosis. Clustering the data, not just one symptom, but the pattern. For Sandra, Matt saw difficulty coping as primary, related to lack of support, overwhelming situation, also powerlessness, anxiety, impaired nutrition. Identifying those related to factors is key for picking the right interventions later. Then planning and outcomes setting goals with the patient. For Sandra, they agreed on finding local support and identifying stress reduction methods. Priorities here are huge. Safety first, always. Then maybe basic needs like nutrition, sleep. Then the coping strategies. Collaboration is key to dietitians, social workers. Definitely a team effort. And patient preferences, culture gotta honor those. Now, implementation. Putting the plan into action. Three main ways. Reduce the stressors, boost resistance, or lessen the body's reaction. Health promotion is big here. Regular exercise, good rest foundational, building support systems, friends, family, groups, time management skills. And techniques like guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, even assertiveness training. Yep, also journal writing, great outlet. And mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, just being present non-judgmentally. Lots of evidence supports MBSR for stress, anxiety. And for nurses, managing workplace stress. Burnout prevention. Vital. Self-care isn't selfish, it's survival. Agencies need to step up to mindfulness programs, better staffing, debriefing. Nurses need to protect their downtime, have outside interests, recharge. So for Sandra, Matt implemented a bunch of things. Private chat, journaling suggestion, exercise log, mindfulness techniques for sleep. Encourage me time, suggested talking to her boss, reminded her about knitting for relaxation, got the dietitian involved for meal planning using their preferences. Explored church support, suggested reaching out to a friend, gave info on the cancer support group, planned ahead for possible home health needs. Really comprehensive. What about acute care crisis intervention when things really fall apart? That's short term, usually resolves in weeks. Focus is safety, first preventing harm, then reducing anxiety. Helping them find resources, problem solve this specific crisis. It's more directive. And restorative care, long term view. Recovery is gradual, especially from chronic stress. A crisis changes you. The goal is helping people integrate the experience, learn skills for the future. Successful coping builds resilience. Finally, evaluation. How do we know if it worked? Again, through the patient's eyes, are they feeling better, sleeping, eating? Are the coping strategies helping? You compare now versus before. It's collaborative. Did we meet the goals? Revise if needed. Reassess symptoms, check outcome achievement. Coping takes time, keep talking. Empower them by involving them in tweaking the plan. Open communication is key for feedback. And if things aren't approving or stress increases, maybe need referrals. So Matt's evaluation with Sandra. He used teach back, checked her logs, monitored stress. After three weeks. She felt she was coping better, less anxious, more hopeful. Nervous habits gone. Vitals improved. Appetite back. Gained weight. Sleeping well. Friends helping with meals. They joined the support group. Progress. Huge progress. Even with John's illness ongoing, they move towards those achievable outcomes. Wow. What a journey through stress and coping. From the body's reaction to the nurse's role, it's incredibly complex, but so fundamental. Absolutely. And you see how vital it is for nurses supporting patients like John and Sandra and managing their own stress. Compassion fatigue, second victim syndrome, these are real occupational hazards. Applying these concepts, ADPIE, the critical thinking, that's core nursing practice, essential stuff for the NCLEX and beyond. Definitely. So 
As you move forward in your own nursing path, here's something to chew on. How will you build your own stress management plan? Because really, taking care of yourself is taking care of your patients. This isn't just chapter knowledge, it's life knowledge. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.